today we have building sustainability or user comfort. And for me, it's a goal to try to find the middle layer which can balance between these two according to who you are. Okay, welcome to Heya Framtiden at uh, SIME 2018. We're here with Elena Malachatka. Yes. Is that a good pronunciation? Amazing. Oh. You're from Russia originally. Yeah, Siberia. Siberia. Mm-hmm. I live in Siberia, in, in Stockholm. <laughs> it's close to us. <laughs> Actually, the same parallel, 60s parallel with the Stockholm, my hometown. Really? Yeah. Hmm. Nice connection. Do, um, you're doing your PhD. At yes. K- KTH in mm-hmm. Stockholm. Royal... Institute of Technology. Institute of Technology, exactly. Um, what brought you there from the beginning? Uh, actually, I, I did my master here uh, seven years ago, and I was curious about green energy and sustainability. And we all know that Stockholm is a green capital of Europe. And when I did my research, what is my next university... I found that KTH is doing a great job in sustainability and I found, yeah, I want to go there and learn from these uh, guys how they are really actually implementing all these brilliant ideas. And I came and did my uh, master here seven years ago, but then I moved to uh, Los Angeles, then I moved back to Russia, to China, to Italy, I traveled around the globe. But then I found several questions I would love to go deeper and explore more. And that's why I started to find uh, the research position in the area around building excellence, building uh, innovation, but related with the user's experience. And I found amazing project which called KTH Living Lab. And that's what really hooked me. And especially because, yeah, I know this university, I know professors from this uh, department. And I just jumped to this uh, uh, research uh, like position competition. And I was first PhD hired for KTH Living Lab. And I'm really proud to be part of this amazing project. So that's how I, that's why I'm here. Yeah. Great research, interesting uh, concept, and uh, passionate about sustainability. <coughs> so what is Living Lab? Actually, Living Lab is a, a research method or concept which uh, bring applied science into the market. Because there are some, several statistics shows that amount of real products on the market out of tried product. It's like very, very tiny. Uh, Finnish uh, Institute of uh, Statistical Data showed one out of 3,000 ICT startups actually reaching the market. What means that it's very, very low statistic of successful projects. And uh, explanation is that we have big disconnection between research, science, even prototyping and real world, which is full of uh, complexity and friction. And uh, Living Lab is a concept where we test uh, products and services into the real market. We are talking not even focus groups, which kind of supposed to be real markets. No, Mm. we talk about real life, real processes with all contexts we can take, put on board. And uh, yeah, we're testing products and services in the real world. In my case, we're testing uh, solutions for, uh, for the clean tech, for the building industry. There are a lot of different types of living lab for mobility, for health, and so on. So living lab is the, the closest to the market research layer. So uh, how does it work? The, the students accept uh, full disclosure? Of course, no. <laughs> <laughs> of course, it's, maybe we would love to have such a way, but uh, of course it's about uh, discussion, and that's what creates process quite slow. Uh, depend on the research case. We have a lot of cases which are not related to end users, like where we test uh, heat pumps, uh, smart heat pumps, and different like um, like IoT related technologies. That's where we we have zero connection with the end users. But from the more research touch end users, and that's where we create uh, agreements between users and research researchers, where we as researchers explain the purpose of the research project, we explain the purpose of data collection, and we explain how we'll use it, in which way, and which output we expect. 
And it's a quite deep collaboration with the end users in the end of the day. Uh, and I think the market actually missing this part where we can understand how our data is used. I think we're not against data or we are, we are for like heavy privacy, but we are for understanding what and how happening with my data. If you take Facebook case, which actually I, I really uh, plan to work quite a lot with Facebook social data. data. It's not question like to Facebook, it's question to, okay, how you guys use our data? If I can, for example, uh, have a one per month pop-up that's, Elena, we use this amount of your data in this way. Yes, we did some marketing. Are you okay with this? Maybe I'm okay with having like some advertisement on the right side of my uh, Facebook page. Maybe I'm not. But no one actually asked me. They have this, um, of course, adjustment conditions and uh, agreements, but they are so on UX by design. What creates more questions for them, why? Because they can't do an honest conversation uh, and uh, at least provide us uh, some information how our data is used in which way. And yeah, it's about honesty and trust. Mm. So how many students are living in these uh, buildings? Yeah, t- coming back to KTH Living Lab, we have, uh, the, we have three buildings. In total, we have 305 uh, apartments and 305 students. But four uh, apartments are active laboratory where we have the higher density of research projects and students are agreed to be in this experimental uh, active laboratory. And the rest are more like what's called passive uh, laboratory where after the first uh, active test where we see that this, for example, service is successful, we scale it out to 300. Because we all know that statistic-wise it's not enough to have only four uh, users to understand is it good or bad service, we need to move to bigger scale. But we cannot move with the radical innovation to bigger scale without testing with a smaller group. Okay. So, uh, I mean, I, I assume a lot of the uh, measurements would be done uh, for hard facts like uh, uh, heat and uh, mm-hmm. air and water yeah. and stuff like that. Um, but you mentioned at the IoT seminar mm-hmm. just now, or I, IoT summit, that uh, you were lacking, you were missing the human element in the, mm-hmm. the smart home discussion. Yes. What do you mean by that? I mean, first of all, I'm missing the desire of users to be part of the process and uh, desire of building developers to place people as a part of the process. Actually, from both sides, we have passiveness. Mm. It's not only about building developers who are ignoring users. That's one uh, part of the story. Second one, users don't want to be active involvement, uh, have a- a active engagement to the process of changing their lifestyle. We are good in complaining. We are bad in actually making some actions how to make our life better. And uh, I, we are missing both. So to actually users wanting to be part of the creation process and also building uh, industry wanted to build for people in the end of the day. So that's one side. Talking about data uh, type as a, like social data, which I mentioned today, uh, users are the richest source of information and data in the building. Hmm. Occupancy, movement, human dynamics, uh, that all could be a great part of improve, approval process and innovation process. Uh, we just don't know how they feel. We don't know. Maybe it's, in, it's okay air quality. Maybe not. Of course, our sensors show that it could be better. But no one complain. No one give us feedback. So that's where I, I think, and in my PhD, I try to integrate this uh, social data layer where we can actually create a feedback between end user and building system to improve his or her uh, quality of life in the building and uh, we I think we are lacking such platforms where users can actually not only complain but actually interact with the system and adjust it and uh, yeah this is a process of both building managers and users some kind of co-creation exactly co-creation it's different types of co-creation actually we have a very passive way we have a very active way but we need to provide these ways for users if you don't want to be disturbed, okay, just adjust system that you want to be just introvert today and not be interacted with the system. But if you have free time and you really feel that air quality is not here, why shouldn't like take initiative and just anyhow interact with the system to improve your life quality, actually? And could you um, theoretically track how active they are or how much they exercise, yeah. how tired they are? Yeah, now I'm... Uh, how well they study? <laughs> We have different types of questions we try to answer. Mm. Uh, we, of course, start with a very simple questions just to train system and build a proper data architecture. Uh, of course, we will measure more and more like um, v- data on the variable devices. Like, I don't really believe in smart watches. I tried around 12 different models 
and I think it's not very comfortable to sleep, and any disconnection in the data flow creates a lot of biases. I found a very nice startup from Finland about Smart Ring, which actually measures the same things uh, from the body. Aura. Aura, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, it's measure heart beating, it's measure positioning, and people can actually sleep with this, take shower, which creates uh, uh, like very smooth flow in data collection about users. Again, we now plan a big workshop with users to discuss how much they want this uh, solution to be actually recorded. They also have option, what's called, to create a data fence. If they, for example, today don't want to uh, be uh, in the experiment, that's their will to just um, take off from this experiment. Opt out. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah, we're talking more and more about like uh, users' data from variable solutions, which is very rich. But again, we need to clearly explain users why do we need such data. If I need, and we have a lot of cases in the data like IoT, home IoT system, where people used, um, the, I think the, the most um, interesting case where people use this Nike or ASICS uh, running app to run, and uh, like um, people who try to like um, uh, like chiefs who try to kind of uh, steal something from their homes, they really try to hack such systems to see um, okay, today he plans to run almost a mm-hmm. marathon. Okay, two hours he or she will not be at home. I can just really do some bad stuff and just broke his locker and so on. What's mean that, and even people that post everything, oh, I'm planning to run a marathon right now. I mean, we need to be smarter sometimes in how what we put uh, online. But again, system like that system has some questions to improve, and that's why we want to work with users to ask and build their data strategy and explain why we want to use the service, which risks or like consequences we can have uh, if we talk about like occupancy data and that we will detect that they are out of the lab, uh, how we can actually improve security system when, the, when we know it. And that's why we need to build first discussion with end users about their like feelings about this type of service, their like needs around these services. Again, I said we're not smartest people in the world to make decisions for them. We need to ask them. And the second step, we need to automate such questions uh, about their feelings and their needs. Can you also nudge them in, a, in different directions, uh, changing their behavior? Of course, we talk a lot and about uh, nudging, and we have several experiments at Living Lab about nudging, especially uh, we have a case about water consumption, which mm-hmm. is related to energy use, usage a lot. But a lot of research uh, projects already show that nudging system is very temporary and it's very difficult to build actual habit, uh, not just uh, have fun or entertain or gamify for a particular time, but then people kind of, okay, this was fun, but thank you, it's not my daily um, service. That's why we need to be smart in uh, playing such uh, cases where we, okay, how much this could become a habit. And there are several like research methods how actually in- integrate service which can build habits rather than just test some kind of a positive effects short time. Hmm. And, and you, you're doing your PhD on this now. Yes. What, what will the result be from your side? Yeah, it's going to be sev- several outputs. Yeah, first of all, is a methodology which can connect data science and user experience design and service design. So that's one output. Second one is a, a testing platform itself with several uh, services which we designing and testing and will create some output. Okay, is it right way or not right way to go? And of course, I, I really aim more to work with sustainability issue and how we can build a model which balance between users' comfort and building sustainability. Because today we have building sustainability or user comfort. And for me, it's a, probably a goal to try to find the middle layer which can balance between these two according to who you are and what is the building. Hmm. Do, do you take into account that these people are mostly single they're young they don't have kids yeah now are they, are they rep- they're not representative yeah now we're moving to like a uh, target audience and it's a very important question of course young students they they're open for so many things could the same approach work with uh, for example elderly people that's a very important question but now on this stage we try to focus on particular target group young people young generation single uh 
living and let's call it solo students' apartment, which is quite a big segment. Once we test uh, and approve some theories and methods on this target area, we can try to create modification of these uh, methods for other target groups and do more experiments around different target groups. For example, I can give you a clear uh, um, a case where I got some uh, students, uh, also researchers, uh, from elderly uh, or hospital um, building environment and they wanted to collaborate and I said I can't because I focused on another group and on this stage I'm not ready to uh, work with a readaptation of our method just because uh, we need to build strong method on this target group and then just ask question how it could be readapted or redesigned or redefined. But this is the next steps which we're of course thinking about. Uh, and it's important to think about. But I'm, again, talking more about a uh, more neutral system out of these frameworks. For example, Facebook, uh, they have access to different types of data. And once I can uh, extract from Facebook information about user preference, about building environment, it doesn't matter like which audience I have. I have a database of all possible users, and I integrate this knowledge to the building optimization. Uh, as I mentioned today, build, uh, Facebook opening the division Building X, what's mean that they will work with this process where you shouldn't care about target audience just because you have all possible audience, almost. I mean, it will probably mm. not so much on Facebook, um, but we can plug in Twitter, we can plug in other like social media. An idea that's to create system which can provide the dialogue between you, any user and any building. But of course, we start with quite a um, uh, simple case where we have students and modern building. And of course, then we will try to understand how we can scale it around other like applications. What, what do you think Facebook wants to accomplish with, with that uh, initiative? Uh, I have three suggestions or like, uh, like, I think ideas. Not only I think I tested their research areas they're working with. And idea that uh, these guys invest big money into understanding physical versus digital or physical with digital. And I think they try to understand how we can uh, bring digital knowledge about people to their physical world. Because sometimes there's a lot of um, questions to Facebook, okay, you bring people to this kind of uh, digital uh, uh, universe, but reality may be not so good how they post on the pictures or stuff like this. And I think deep on deep level, they try to understand what is the actual difference between physical life of people and digital life. And life is happening in the buildings. That's why they try to, uh, from the deeper layer, understand what is the physical lifestyle and what is digital lifestyle. So that's the first question they try to answer. Second one, they want to understand uh, which type of data, Facebook data, social data, can explain our behavioral patterns and how we, what type of information we can extract to actually understand who we are in the physical world. And now they're building this huge campus. Uh, and I know that they are hiring researchers who can integrate social media, uh, like uh, network analysis uh, knowledge, into the building planning. What means that these guys will build cities which people want, because they want what you like. And of course, building which build according to your preferences, you will definitely love it. And I think these guys pretend, at least, to start to influence on how we design and develop and build physical worlds, including buildings, cities, and so on. Ambition. And uh, are uh, construction companies and real estate companies interested in what you're doing? Are, are any on board? Uh, I mean, the building itself we're working with is uh, operated and built by Einar Matson, so it's a construction company. I'm not working directly with them, because we have our lab where we do stuff. And uh, I can tell you honestly, even these four apartments uh, require so much time and focus to really design and build all what we're talking about. What's mean that probably there are so many companies wanting to build living labs. Please do it, guys, because it's an amazing uh, way to explore new horizons for innovation. I personally don't plan to, I am not working and I don't plan to work just because I want to focus on this research question, uh, research project and answer all questions I set as a researcher. But uh, in the future, after PhD, yeah, maybe new areas, new research areas. Hmm. We've been talking a bit about uh, Internet of Things today, and um, many conclude that uh, the applications are not very user-friendly always, and uh, they are not very well connected to each other. Do you think that will change, um, and how? Yeah, the problem that in the end of the day, the all friction we meet uh, are in people. 
and in like lack of desire to change your mentality. And the problem with the industries, uh, especially like construction industry, I mentioned that uh, big data index is the lowest. Uh, just because uh, it's comfortable business, it's uh, quite profitable, it's a lack of uh, burning bridges, what makes these people uh, not be so stressed about innovation. Normally people innovate when they have problems, not when they have everything is okay. And this industry feels quite good and that's why they have like lack of motivation to innovate. That's why I think they don't want to change too much. Uh, but changes, as we discussed today, are needed because we need to build better environment for people and user-oriented. And I think if we have more research projects around this, more like uh, facts around this, uh, more statistics, maybe it, we will. It could be some kind of wave of discussion about that. It's needed. Mm -hmm. But again, when we talk about uh, building uh, industry innovation, uh, a lot of things are so seamless, like air quality, noise pollution. Maybe only in 10 years you will notice that you become stressed and it's because it's for, caused by noise, noise pollution. That's why it's so much research and data should be collected to actually understand this. And a lot of uh, consequences, they are very seamless, what make them like not to say that, oh, that's not our mistake, it's maybe something else. Hmm. I, I hope we will have more uh, change in the future uh, because the world is changing and uh, I think this part of the world that's why, yeah, we need to innovate more around this and we need to innovate around people's lives. And what, what kind of sustainability benefits would you expect uh, as the outcome when, uh, you, when, you, when more companies start measuring these things? Yeah, first think, of all... First of all, energy consumption, for example. But we need to divide. We have four different types of sustainability. One is environmental, mm. which is the most popular. And, of course, uh, we try to save more and more energy. But I like the research um, uh, survey from Denmark where they show that it's a third which people care about uh, when we talk about efficiency, energy efficiency, so, uh, like environmental issue. People care about their health, that's number one, and then kind of some costs. And only then like, oh yeah, that's and also it's good, uh, good for, for planets. But it's not like what we think the first. And we need to understand it, that in, people will not prioritize this uh, in the massive scale. Some individuals, yeah. But if you talk about the mainstream, we need to, I think, um, we need to link these areas where we provide them with a healthy service and also sustainable service. We need to kind of integrate sustainability into more individual needs. But okay, sustainability, we have an environmental one where we actually need to care more about how much energy and resources we are using. Second one is uh, uh, social sustainability, how well people feel inside the building, how they're emotionally uh, comfortable inside the building. And that's what a lot of companies ignore. They're okay with only environmental sustainability. Okay, I save 30%, done. But what if 30% uh, of your uh, residents are extremely annoyed with a cold in your apartments? Hmm. And your great saves, uh, savings in the environmental segment cause a lot of discomfort for end users. And we know such cases in Sweden where just com some companies just decrease their temperature and they thought this is a great idea, but not for users. Third one is economical. How much you're building actually uh, financially sustainable? How much you are aware about some costs in 5, 10, 30 years? Of course, it's uh, maybe going to be big headache in 20, 30 years. Maybe let's discuss and plan it now. And for us now, it's more technological. How much you pay attention to making your building, even if it's through innovation, actually sustainably developing all these three other uh, sustainabilities. So when people ask about sustainability, we need to yeah, point which one exactly. And I believe in ecosystematic approach where we take into consideration all four. And uh, it's easy to see only one part, but i give you an example that it could mm. be not so um, successful example. So um, let's hope for a more consumer yeah. or customer-centric approach yeah. from these companies. Yeah. Thank you so much, Elena. Uh, good luck with your PhD. Thank you. And let's hope uh, we see more of these labs in the future. Yeah, I also and that, hope so. Um, the uh, construction sector is um, adopting these ideas. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, Heia Framtiden will be back next time with something different. Uh, you, we can be found at heiaframtiden.se. This is uh, from SIME 2018.